road, if you, you recognize it, curves, curves, and this is the farm that I'm talking about. Uh, historically, the farm, currently it's 93 acres. Historically, it had been 201 acres. It came across like this, went down out and around. But I wanted to start talking about this because I'm going to go back to around 1550, so I can trace this back pretty far. So just give me five minutes. Let me review a little bit of U.S. history so everybody understands. You never did well in history class. <laughs> but I'm going to go back to about 1550 of this area. In 1623 is when the Dutch first erected a fort on the Delaware River. Now that's that's 70 years after I'm going to start here to give you a, a reference point. In 1664, King Charles II, the English, threw, threw the Dutch out, took over, and in 1674, all the Dutch claims were given to England. Now, William Penn, everybody's heard about William Penn. Well, William Penn's father was owed a huge amount of money by the King of England. Didn't have the money. So, William Penn's father was given the land that we may now talk about. That's Pennsylvania, includes Delaware, and some overlapped areas. And uh, that was in 16. Now, Pennsylvania, we all understand Penn, and then Sylvania is Latin, that means woodland. Penn's woodland, not Penn's woods, but Penn's woodland. And in 1682, uh, William Penn first divided up Pennsylvania into three counties, Chester, Philadelphia, and Bucks. So in 1682, everybody in this area we were in Chester County. I don't know if you ever knew that. In 1684, two years later, William Penn started selling huge manors of Pennsylvania. Wanted some money, wanted to get what his dad was owed. Well, in 1698, the Shawnee Indians settled along the Susquehanna River. Now, you've heard of the Susquehannocks. They were a small tribe, and I have a slide that will come up, that really didn't have their own identity, but they were made up of stragglers, it appears, from a lot of the other tribes. It was almost like uh, no one wanted them, so let's form our own. But uh, in 1703, William Penn separated Delaware off. Now, here's the critical thing. In 1718, that's three, almost 300 years ago, William Penn dies. His kids, grandkids take over, and they go, we're going to start selling this land, we're going to lease it, we're going to charge rent. In 1718, from Ireland, let me get the next slide. In 1718, the Irish had a mass exodus. That's, that's Ireland. I hope people understand the geography. That most of the people in this area came from Ulster and they left because of religious persecution, death, minor things. Um, I'll leave this up for a second. But that, that's 1905. That is the front picture of the running pump farm. I had this digitally enhanced, enlarged. And uh, Bill, we, I believe we enlarged that. I think that's a, a could be BF Moyer. Uh, and there's a little old lady there, and then there's some old guy, I don't know who he is, in, in the stable. But bringing you up to history, in 1718 was a huge first migration out of Ireland in 725 the second very large migration out of Ireland 
two United States. They came up to Chesapeake, they came to Philadelphia, and many of them came to our area here in Seven. And the initial squatters, not settlers, but the initial squatters on the running pump farm was Joseph Barry Hill, his brother Andrew. There were four brothers and all their families. They left their parents in Ireland who died. And the family took off, came to the United States, and they, they settled on this farm. But you have to remember, the Indians late claimed that the king owned it, but John uh, William Penn and John Penn legally had title from the English. So it, it's a mixed bag. We do have the land grant given and signed by John Penn to Andrew Berry Hill. We also have, it's in the Hershey Museum on parchment, the original land grant signed by the King of England with his wax seal, the Hershey Museum had. Really cool one, I'll, I'll show you that. Um, but I, I think it's important that people just have a little idea of some of the history. To give a reference now, John Harris Jr., who was the founder of Harrisburg, was born in 1727. So, we're talking about early from an American history standpoint. Now, in 1729, Lancaster County was first established. So in 1729, this farm, and I also refer to this farm including all of Lower Paxton, Paxton, this whole region, was now in Lancaster County. Well, if you move, change. In 1751, the Lancaster County records state, in Lancaster County, there were 500 homes with white settlers, and all of Pennsylvania had 190,000 souls, but they also state, which does not include the pagan inhabitants, they were talking about the Indians. So a lot of what I may say may refer to white people, these are historical facts, I'm not being racist. But um, Fort Hunter was established in 1755. Now, why is that important? If you look at this picture from 1905, you see the stone wall? Well, when I bought the farm in 2003, that stone wall was right up against Lingle's Town Road. So Lingle's Town Road currently today is right here. Give you an idea. And I'll get back to that, but just to put it in some <coughs> reference. When I bought the farm in 2003, this house was existing. It was tumbling down, but it was existing. Everything else, oh, it was gone. Uh, also, historically, this building had been referred to as Fort Berry Hill. Now, you'll hear a lot of uh, names of forts. Fort Berry Hill, Fort Gilcrest, Fort Hunter. There were provincial forts and then there were what I call settlers' forts. The settlers' forts were nothing, well look at it, that's not much of a fort. It was really nothing more than a fortified building with, with a couple gun slots. Most of the time they didn't fight for these buildings, they hid it. And when Andrew Berry Hill was killed and scalped behind here, his family hid in there. And I have the death records as well, so it's pretty pretty. But Fort Hunter was a provincial fort. Provincial meaning the British paid for it. The British many times staffed it, or they paid settlers to staff it. And in reading letters from Benjamin Franklin, who amazingly was very involved in, in what's going on here back then, the biggest problem they had was all the settlers' protectors were drunks. They were, they'd shoot each other, so they had more deaths from each other than they did from, from Indians. So time-wise, time um, there's also a Fort Swatera, which is towards Lebanon, and that was a provincial fort. That was 1757. Um, anyway, in, in, 
let me get into now in 1725. That's the nearest date that I can actually document. This farmland was squatted upon, not settled. But they just got there and said, okay, we're going to build a house, we're going to plant crops. I do have documents that claim or state that this land had no trees at all. It was barren, barren field uh, back in those days. So uh, there are some forests with trees now. But back then, this was barren land. And uh, in 1725 is about the earliest I can establish that the squatters arrived, which was Joseph Berry Hill. As far as the Indians, we're around here, to give you an idea. So the Indian groups that lived in the valley were surrounded by the following, you know, Shawnee, Iroquois. And interesting enough is the Shawnee, who were a strong tribe, were documented many times for coming into the valley. And of the Berry Hill brothers, three of them were killed by Indians. Two of them I have it documented, at least the documents. Now, I think David said one thing he learned about his you don't know, it lies. I can only tell you what I read, and I've read a lot of documents. Um, this is John Penn, 1681. This is not William Penn, but this is grandson. I, I, that's the only picture that I could find of him, and that, of course, is the settlers. When the Irish, and they were Scotch-Irish, they left Ireland in 1718 and 1725. Three quarters of them sailed into the Chesapeake up to Philadelphia, and then they settled where we are, and many a times they continued down uh, south. Uh, the first settler of, let's get to the meat of the matter, the first settler of the Run and Pump farm was Joseph Berry Hill and his wife Hannah. Now Joseph stayed on Running Pump Farm for a number of years with all his brothers, excuse me for But over the years, and I'll give you the dates, the other Berry Hill brothers were killed by Indians during the, uh, the Indian Wars. Joseph Berry Hill ultimately traveled further south and died in North Carolina. And I read his will, and I'll tell you some interesting points of the will, which it, it's just very interesting fodder, if you will. He died in 1781. And back then, for example, he willed his wife Hannah, his uh, Negro wench doll. You know, these are things that you can't comprehend. But, and you have to also understand, in our area, there was slavery back in that period of time. Matter of fact, in the Wenrick Church, which we'll get to, which is the next owner, there are slaves buried there, but they're buried outside the wall of the cemetery. But they are there. You'll also notice, as I'm going down now, the historical owners of the Running Pump Farm, 95% of them are all buried in Wenrick Cemetery, which is interesting. They, they just never went far. Um, so Andrew Berry Hill Sr. had four sons. He and his brother originally squatted and built what became known as Running Pump Farm. This was the Running Pump Tavern, and they also called that Fort Berry Hill, obviously named after the town. Now, the picture I showed you earlier is actually this building. This part was torn out in 1880, and I'll discuss that. Um, But in, in 1756, Andrew Berry Hill Sr., that was uh, one of the original squatters, not settlers yet, they had no legal right of ownership. Andrew Berry Hill Sr., November 15, 1755, because we found his death record. 
you can actually go, and I was, I was floored, you can actually go in this case, remember it was in Chester County, in this time period the farm was in Lancaster County, they had the death record, and the newspaper. Andrew Perry Hill was killed and scalped there. Um, so we, we know the day. Our records are good now, but the records back then are actually, were actually pretty good. In 1860, his other brother Samuel was killed and scalped by Indians. And the records noted Samuel's wife Martha escaped from the Indians by swimming across the Susquehanna River during the high stage. He was killed by Fort Hunter. Now, if you, you know Lingelstown Road, which is right out front, but back in this time period, it was called Fort Hunter Road. That was the main Indian travel, kind of Stoga wagon. That was the, the wagon train, east to west. And they usually would travel from fort to fort. So they would go, if you notice and look at the old fort locations on maps, between each fort, theoretically, was about a day's travel. So if a local settler got in trouble, and trouble was usually well, either drunk trouble or Indian trouble. They could go to a fort, but at least they could get there by nightfall. That was the theory behind it. So, the father of Andrew Berry Hill Jr., who initially got the land grant, he was killed in, in 1756. His uncle that was killed in 1760. And, uh, William Berryhill, I forgot about him, but he was the other brother. He was killed in 1755. And he also was uh, killed by Indians and scouted. Now, I'll throw something out just time-wise. 1762, anybody hear about the Paxton boys? Yeah. As a result of all these Indian killings, and some of them happened on the Running Pump Farm, the Paxton boys, and I don't want to mischaracterize, but what I've read is they were a bunch of guys who got drunk and just basically wiped out the Susquehannock Indians who were remaining. Well, they called the kind there were there were Susquehannock Indians, but they also called them the Conestoga Indians, and then the wagon was named after the Indian tribe, not the other way around, actually. So. Uh, but in 1765, um, I think I have that next. This, 7, 1756, I'm sorry. This was the original land grant issued by John Penn, and then he had a surveyor general. And that is what gave Andrew Berry Hill Jr. I have to preface that by saying they did not use senior and junior back then. Everybody in every generation was called either William Samuel Andrew, so I, I really had to kind of figure this out. So I'm calling him Jr. Um, and, and interesting, in the 1780 and 85 tax assessments, it also notes, because they, they Look, every government wants their taxes. They did very good census reports even back then, tax assessments. But back then you were taxed on the land, the structures, and your slaves. And, and so the tax assessments, the assessment rules would say free white men, free white women, and then you know, enslaved people. Um, so from Andrew Berry Hill, Andrew Berry Hill Jr., I should say. While Andrew Berry Hill Jr. owned the farm, that is, by the way, from the Hershey Museum, on parchment, that, and, and that is the King of England. You know, they had the range, it's like the movies, they drip wax. That is the land uh, on the parchment from the King. And in this case, you can see Andrew Berry Hill. Even though that does say senior, I think it says, but senior was dead in the land grant. It granted the land to Andrew Berry Hill Jr., but it noted in there 
that he settled there and his father was killed by Indians. To be a first grantor, first landowner, you had to have an attachment or an investment into the land. You couldn't just call the king up or text the king and say, I want some land. You have to be living there, you have to farm it. In this case, his father died protecting it. Uh, those were some of the criteria. The, uh, John Penn and the Penn family, they taxed people. That's why they wanted all these settlers. That was their, their revenue. The Berry Hill generations died out. There's something interesting that I found in the chain of title on the running pump farm. And my family is only the fifth family in 300 years to own the farm. The farm originally was owned, as I said, by Joseph Berry Hill, then it went to Andrew Sr., Andrew Jr. So it typically would be passed down through the generations. And in 1784, this gentleman purchased the farm, not related to the Berry Hills. He bought the, well, I bought the farm. Do you know where that expression comes from? World War II, when someone would get killed in action, they'd get some money from the government, enough to pay off the farm. And that expression was, he bought the farm. That's where that expression comes from. There's nothing to do with this. This is Franz Weinreich. He's been called Francis. He is a heck of a pump to do going on. But um, when he purchased the running pump farm, and he purchased it in 1784, he was the one that named it the running pump farm. And he purchased it in 1784. He was the one that named it the Running Pump Farm. The Running Pump Tavern was built in 1741 by the Berry Hill family. They called it Mount Hill. Now I know the restaurant at Lingelstown and Colonial, that's called Mount Hill. But I believe Berry Hill had ownership of that also at one point. That was Mount Hill. After the running pump farm was Mount Hill. Franz Wenrick bought the farm in 1784. What existed on the farm was a running pump tavern. It was also called the running pump hotel. It was a stopover point for all the travelers going east, west, down the trail. Um, and, but back then, the deed in 1784 said 201 acres. That's the earliest recorded land size that uh, I could find. Now, when he ultimately sold the farm in 1825, after his death, the farm had been cut down to 134 acres. He donated land to Wenrick Cemetery, Wenrick Church. He did sell 60-some acres to a, a man that I cannot find any historical reference to, and I'm going to throw it out there, Aaron Kreiser. If anybody has heard of that name. Now, interesting, Franz Wenrick's wife's maiden name was Kreiger with a G. And I'm guessing maybe that's her brother, a relative. It could be, it's a guess. I can't find any reference to him. Um, but, um, and he, he passed away, and they sold the farm in 1825. Now, in 1825, a fellow by the name of Henry Meese, oh, that's Weinrich's church. That is, I don't expect you to read it because I couldn't read it with a magnifying glass. But a lot of the reference materials that I've been getting, I get from the will. And it's tough to read. Many of web websites I've found actually have people, I guess, have nothing else to do with it. They will read the old documents and type them so you can access it. And it's, it's super. It's really helpful. Henry Meese and his wife Elizabeth purchased the farm in 1825. So this is the third family. 
all these years down on the farm. And uh, in 1836, Henry Meese's son Joseph built a small house on the farm. This is this is the old 1875 map many people look at. Here's the farm you'll see on the map. It says Jamie's. This is Langlestown. Now, uh, we walked with a bunch of people, with, with Bob Thomas. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the old, the old, well, actually, right there is the stock certificate. Right behind, in the back of my farm, is you, you can see where they were hand digging in the railroad. I understand they had like hundreds of Chinese workers hand digging all that. It's still there, you can walk it. I never knew that. And of course, this is the map of Willow Paxton. Um, on the Mies Farm, now back then, people were religious, they gave, they donated. Uh, in 1880, they built the Mount Zion School on the Running Pump Farm. And I saw where they actually leased it. See, so I can do leasing on my farm. They've been doing that for a long time. The, the farm, the building here when it was built, I, I saw records cost $727 to build the whole thing and furnish it and put blackboards in there and, and everything else ready and the books to open. Now, in 1850, there's a note in one of the deeds, and I found this note, and I'll read it word for word. It's just east of the running pump tavern. Let's get settled. Here we are. This is Lingle's Town Road. If you look at the entrance to the farm, it's current. It's right here. That's gone, of course, and I'll tell you a little history about it. This was the Running Pump Tavern. In 1850, Joseph Meese, the son of the owner, built this little cottage for his parents. And uh, there's a note in the deed that says, and it didn't specify, even though I think it's right here. Maybe you asked me where it did. But it says, Joseph Meese came upon a cave with bones of several humans. Not knowing if these bones were from Indians or white men, Joseph closed up the cave. So if you want to go metal detective and knock yourself out, if that's right in this area, and Lingolstown Road currently runs right where the fence is. In 1851 was the school that I showed you. But what's also interesting is in the early 1800s, the Mises, and this is where the name Running Pump Tavern came from. There's a stream right here, and it goes across what's now Lingle's Town Road. They took 36 foot logs that were 18 inches in diameter. They burned holes through them. They put the logs in the stream under the trail, which is now Lingle's Town Road, and they piped water into the tavern. Hence the name Running Pump Tap. This was one of the first structures to have indoor plumbing. The black I don't know if they had a durable, but uh, they, they had indoor plumbing. In, in 1860, give you again a time frame, the original picture had this building for Running Pump Tavern, which is also Fort Berry Hill but it had a second, which was a kitchen, attached to it. In 1860, Joseph Beast, the son of the current owner in, back in 1825, took the kitchen down, demolished it, without a permit, but he took it down. All the stonework for the, the kit, from the kitchen that he took down is right here. And it was also the stonework for the foundation of the house that was built in 1880. Now, I think Nevin Moyer, I saw a note, was born in that house. Oh, yes. uh, and we'll get, we'll get to him. So all of this 
and the uh, foundation wall was on that building was actually part of the running pump tower. Now the Meese family owned the property 1825 to 1873 and then in 1873 Joseph Meese, the son, took title. Um, one thing I also noticed in the, in the late 1800s that the owners had multiple wives, <coughs> different times. But, you know, you, I thought back then you married your wife kind of forever. No, I divorced them. Uh, and that was it. You know, I found that very interesting. In 18... I'm sorry. In 1873, <laughs> Joseph Meese redid the piping. I guess he modernized it and made bigger piping, longer piping. Um, in 1879, the Locust Hill School was closed, and the new school, which I showed you was the Mount Zion School, was put up. Now, in, in 1880 to 1883, a fellow by the name of Jesse Lanker owned the farm. But he also married into the Meese family. I don't know if you've ever heard, I had to really figure out who he was. So, because Bill's from the Meese family, sort of. Now moving forward, in 1883, B.F. Moyer, that's the name you hear quite often, Benjamin F. Moyer, uh, got a hold of the farm. In 1908, this barn, not this one, but who? No, this one. This is a 1905 photo. In 1908, this barn was hit by lightning, burned to the ground and then, then they rebuilt. However, that's not the original barn. There was an earlier barn, and I found, I'll, I'll find the date. There was an earlier barn that was torched. They arrested a man by the name of Joseph Poorman, who hired two people, and they torched the first barn. And they rebuilt it. In 1908, this was hit by lightning, burned to the ground, and they again rebuilt it. Now, at this time period, this farm was 134 acres. In 1910, uh, B.F. Moyer died, and the farm went to his children, Nevin Moyer and Irene, uh, Nevin's sister. Nevin had I'm sure most people have heard about Nevin Moyer. Now, Nevin Moyer had been born off in this house. From 1910 to 1932, Nevin and his sister Irene, whose married name was Unger, and that's a very popular old name in this area as well. And in 1932, an executor for 30 days had ownership and back then there were people who I don't know if they didn't probate things like today but an executor took possession they figured out who would own it and then they transferred it so the executor named Ezra Care had ownership for 30 days but then the in 1932 to 1952 Nevin Moyer and his wife Sarah owned the farm now while Nevin owned the farm he sold off a few pieces here and there of the farm. This, in 1913, by the way, Running Pump Tavern, this picture is from 1913. In 1913, the tavern was knocked down. It was falling down, but it, it, they took it down. It, you can't read it, but we can surely get copies for you, but there was a big article and write-up that the local papers did. Now, on this side of the Running Pump Tavern was where their outdoor kitchen originally was. And that's what was taken down to help build the stone wall and the house. Now, ultimately, Nevin Moyer sold the farm. If you notice, this is his head. He advertised it as 84 acres, and he was dead on, as I found out. Years later, after I bought it, we 
we could only find 84 acres in Wyoming. Now we know it's probably true. Look at his phone number, though. It's kind of not much. This is an aerial photo. Nearest we can figure was around 1950. We're trying to date the cars and and so forth. If you notice, here's Lingle's Town Road. You notice it's right up against this stone. In the earlier 1905 picture, Lingle, well, it wasn't called Lingle's Town Road, but it was way down here. It was at one point uh, Market Street. Uh, this was the house built in 1880 that Nevin Moyer was born in. That's 18. 63. Yeah. You're right. You're right. 1862 because the cornerstone. Yeah. yeah. I'm it's sorry. You are. You are correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, the Running Pump Tavern. Look, history isn't always right, and neither am I. So yeah, please <laughs> correct. Oh, no, it was an actual stone up on the top, in between those two windows that gave the actual. Yeah, daughter. So you can see it. Here. Yeah, this, this was where the Running Pump Tavern was. This was at one point that I called mother-in-law's kind of house. Uh, and of course, there was uh, small barns, equipment sheds, you know, the typical thing you, you, you find on a farm. Uh, I actually read a document when Andrew Barry Hill was killed, which was 1756 when his wife and, and his son ran to what was Running Pump Tavern, apparently they had a stairwell in on the first floor that went up to a loft. Underneath that stairwell in the floor was, was a, a hidden panel that they could drop down below and seal themselves in. So it wasn't a fort where they, they fought from, like the movie. No John Wayne stuff here. They literally just went down and they simply hit until the coast was clear. And uh, the, the Eister family purchased the farm in uh, 1952. As they passed, it went to their son, Charles, and Dottie Eister. Dottie still lives in the house right at the end of the farm. And then in 2000, I had purchased the farm. Um, yeah. To to give you a, an interesting fact, this survey was performed uh, by Nevin or ordered by Nevin Moore. He hired the surveyor. But my point, what's interesting, this is now this is what we call now Eagles Town Road. But if you notice, it says Market Street, which was before that Fort Hunter Road. But if you notice, currently, Lingle's Town Road comes up this way and then kind of hooks. When Nevin had the farm, he subdivided a couple pieces off, a little bit here, uh, a little bit up here. Is that the what, Rescue Drive? And there's a couple of houses up there. That was chopped off the farm. And, and interesting, I bought a piece of ground about six, seven years ago that's right here that brought the farm back to one piece. It had been over the years chopped apart and different people had, had owned it. Um, and over here was the 65 acres that uh, Wenrick had sold to uh, Mr. Kreiser, which I think turns out to be, is that a black church from Philadelphia and yeah, Masonic Black on the other side of the North Park. Correct. And they've owned it since 1905. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? You come down, there's a parkway, and then there's a big open 65 acres there that was not sold, I think it was donated. They had some schools there primarily for for uh, black orphans. They still own it. It's just vacant. It's been vacant since many, many years. But during the war times, and war time, I'm, I don't know about revolutionary war, minor, but definitely civil war. They used the fields as a uh, 
parade grounds, marching grounds, and practice the soldiers came. Um, now, topography-wise, this area is very flat back here. Then there's a bump in the middle and another bump rise. So I'm only guessing, but this area is quite huge. It's flat, and uh, it may not be a bad idea to, you know, metal detectors sometime. Yeah, we started that. It's a lot of walking, but. Um, yeah. Map is had his troop always to uh, yep. training prior to World War One. The governor's troop used the ground. This area also was at one point part of the farm. It was chopped off, the road was brought there, and I think there were three or four houses built. What was really common and still is for farmers, when you need some money, you take some land, chop it into a couple of house lands, you need to buy a new tractor. I mean, that's typically over the years what would happen. Um, but the, the primary buildings on this entire farmstead has always been in this general area here. And this, of course, was the Running Pump Tavern and the, the little in-law suite. Uh, there was a big, big barn here when in, uh, around 2001, I think, it was taken down. And the Amish removed it. It's in, in uh, Lancaster somewhere right now. Is it West Virginia? Yeah. They had barn builders come to take it down. Is it? Yes, sir. Would there ever have been a running pump post office prior to the Civil War so that someone that hailed from that area could have been given credit as having come from running pump? I, I've never seen a reference, but I've seen references to the Lingelstown post office. Okay. Um, prior to the Civil War, Daniel Moyer had a store in uh, Lingelstown and he had the post office. But at that point in time, uh, his grandson who was Benjamin Franklin Moyer, B.F. Moyer, he had not, was not married yet. So they weren't on the farm. But uh, Daniel Moyer had a farm and he did have a post office. He was the postmaster. In the, yeah. in now, if someone had sent a letter to, you know, <coughs> Running Pump Hotel, because it was also called the Running Pump Hotel, it put up many of the settlers passing through. Well, I know there's a running pump in Lancaster County also. Well, oh, I don't doubt there's, when I Google right. running pump, they're like all over the place. But when they claim that the Gorgas family of Panama Canal thing came from running pump, have you ever found anything to substantiate that? No, but actually, Jim, I was talking to, uh, Jim has a Civil War store in Mechanicsburg, and he's pretty much, I've known Jim like 40 years, an expert. Jim has information, and he was sharing with me today, and I'm going to follow up. Yes, Jim, go ahead. Uh, several sites say Running Pump, Dolphin County, that he was born. Some say Running Pump, Lancaster. And that's what we're trying to figure well, out. You have to remember, Lancaster was here. Yeah, but been. he was born after Dalton County. He's 1818. Lancaster uh, broke off 1780. I mean, Dalton broke off 1785. Right. Okay? But I've had retired Army colonels say that Gorgas was born at the running pump farm. What I'm thinking, do people stay? in the inn or tavern for a while? Was he maybe born at the tavern, but he's not from? Could have been, because See I mean? there, there are many references I've found where it called it the Running Pump Hotel. So right. that that could That's be. That's what I'm trying to, because like, you know, like Bill was talking about, Orcus later became head of Confederate Orcus. Pennsylvania, because his wife, Confederate. Was there, his dad, his wife's dad was governor of Alabama, so he's uh -huh. down there. But he's had a Confederate ordinance, but he was born in some sites, they run all the town. That's interesting. So God has to come to your store. Yeah. <laughs> because I've ordered many, many books and we've gone to museums, documents. You also have to remember there's conflicts. Uh, most of history was written down the word of mouth and tweaked and turned 
And it is a filtering process, but I am following up on that when Jim and I were talking about that earlier tonight. Jim, there's a possibility of Henry Meese and Joseph Meese hired people who worked the farm. Yep. Uh, there is a book over at the Hershey Museum uh, that has their accounts of who they paid, how much they paid an hour. Uh, I have access to that. Uh, and before you leave, give me the exact spelling of the name. We can check. It's possible they may have been sharecroppers or worked on the farm. Gorgas was a big name around here. I collect, um, I collect postcards, late 1800, and Gorgas. There's a Gorgas drugstore in Harrisburg. There's Gorgas in the mechanics where they start a lot of business in Gorgas. Yeah, it's They're very, really prominent in this area. Yeah, it's very possible that he could have been uh, living on the farm at that time. Right. Okay. Any other? Yes. Yeah. Just for their consumption, or uh, well, a little bit of both. Back in the day, in the 1700s, you also have to remember their production built by hand. So most of it was either personal consumption, even on the Berry Hills, there was four families you know, that came here. So they consumed a lot, but they were also trading. Yeah, you know, there was a lot, there was because you have, you have to put into context uh, the money. There wasn't U.S. currency, matter of fact, there was no U.S. So what was the trade? Was beaver pelts or something you produced on your farm, whether it be timber, vegetables, um, they grew hay a lot on this farm, which is, we still do after 300 years. But I know Nevin Moyer, for example, Nevin didn't farm at all. Nevin hired a commercial farmer like I, I have today. Both the Meese family and the Moyer family, Benjamin, they all had grain uh, and stuff they sold. I, I've seen the accounts of the money they've taken in, how much they made a bushel, and uh, they did sell uh, their product. Uh, there were quite a few mills in our area uh, that did uh, milk the grain. And their occupation and all the census data back to Mises and Moyers were all farmers. That was their sole occupation. So back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, of course they were producing to sell, to bring to market. But at that point too, we were much more populated than the original settlers. Anybody else? Well, thank you.